This is Duke University. Limited documentation and limited access to what documentation exists has been the core impediment to dance scholarship. Although dancers and dance scholars have labored intensively to articulate alternate, alternate value systems, in a culture of knowledge that valorizes disembodied archival records, dance practices have been dispossessed of their histories. The absence of documentation has presented an enormous barrier to the legitimacy of dance as a field of study. Though writing, film, video, and other technologies of memory have assisted in the transfer of dance knowledge across geographical distances and temporal gaps, the principal and great and arguably most expedient means of transmitting dances has always been from dancing body to dancing body. Oral traditions and notation systems of various sorts have bolstered the foundational mimetic scenario of dance education, which includes more than the simple translation of movement from one body to another. In order to learn a dance style or a set choreography, one needs to participate in a dancing community, which entails epistemological and ethical infrastructures. Dancers and dance practices have generally been intertwined, uh, with dancers being implicated in the perpetuation of practices by carrying the layered histories of movement in their bodies, as both personal biography and communal choreography. Not only skill, then, but lineage has been important to a dancer's overall valuation. Fluent observers seek out family resemblances in movement styles that evidence training within certain schools or communities usually with distinct regional variations. In this economy of movement, eyewitness accounts and first-person narratives, for example, by dance critics, anthropologists, and creative practitioners themselves, have formed the basis of dance scholarship. Times have changed. Thanks to the ubiquity of digital technologies, from consumer-grade electronics to high-end professional gear, dance is experiencing a digitization boom for which there is no historical precedent. Libraries and other institutions have begun digitizing their holdings and making them available online. Artists are partnering with academic and government institutions to take control of their own archives, curating their, their careers for online viewers. Clips from dance television programs, past and present, circulate online, and decades of music videos are now accessible on Vivo. Meanwhile, dancers at home and in their backyards, on school grounds and public plazas, in streets and in clubs, in coffee shops and shopping malls, post their dances on YouTube and Facebook. Dance practices have always been on the move, and no amount of analysis will be able to account for the sheer variety of scenarios in which dancing appears. With increased access to video doc documentation, however, dance studies can attend to more aspects of dance's movements across bodies, across populations and geographic distances, across media technologies and devices. The impact of this unleashing of documentation could not be more profound. It has reshaped how choreographers source and generate movement material, fueling contemporary artists turn to the archive for inspiration and reinterpretation. It has altered the landscape of available gestures for both conceptual and popular artists, who find in social media sites vast treasure troves of and choreography. It has fundamentally changed the teaching of dance history, which once relied upon photographs and grainy complaint videos. And it has shifted the possibilities and demands for contemporary dance studies with the formulation and development of digital research projects. Let me be clear. For those of us who produce or conduct research in the areas of dance, movement, or gesture, this is our Gutenberg. Many emerging projects are taking shape without scholars being versed in digital technologies or media studies, yet their research trajectories have required them to grapple with dance practices that employ digital media, or they're finding that the tools of digital analysis are opening avenues, um, uh, opening previously laborious or impossible avenues of research. Principal vectors include archaeologies of media technologies and systems of dance documentation, Visualizing networks of influence and support. 
geographically mapping the trajectories of dancers and dance companies, and investigations into the cultural politics of dance practices digitally enabled global circulations. Some projects leverage tools and techniques from the digital humanities. So there are um, born digital uh, works of scholarship, um, but some projects are, are more concerned with digital sociality and therefore with digital objects, and they orient toward questions of cultural fluency, the ethics of embodiment, and the movement of political and social bodies. Such scholarship questions the right of access and challenges the will to knowledge attending technologies of capture and display. Key in this type of work is a critique of embodiment, which both describes the fact of being a body and the process of incorporating and storing sensory and kinesthetic information. This can no longer be taken as the disinterested ground of physical practice. Indeed, debates regarding the cultural politics of embodiment have persisted in dance studies for quite some time, articulated alongside revised genealogies of performance initiated by Brenda Dixon Gottschild's groundbreaking Africanist readings of um, works in ballet choreographer George, George Balanchine's Oak. Such re-readings of dance's embodied archives and its physical artifacts have rewritten the histories of concert and social dance forms alike troubling the ease with which white choreographers, performers, and social dancers took up movement vocabularies as a natural resource that, if combined with their own labor, could unproblematically become their own. Social media have now opened access to global databases of artistic, popular, and folk gestures and accelerated their rates of transfer across populations and domains. The cultivation of global citizenship is increasingly becoming a question of corporeal cosmopolitanism, and therefore a question of this very ethics of embodiment. So I want to linger on this topic for the balance of my time because there's a lot of anxiety around this particular issue. From Beyonce performing movement called from Bob Fosse to Miley Cyrus twerking, to contemporary experimental choreographers grabbing gestures from popular culture and social media. <laughs> freedom to move and freedom to embody movement is contested. Here, two mutually exclusive cultural logics confront each other. A logic in which danced movement is an expression of cultural belonging, and a logic in which dance movement is a belonging, a form of property, that can be appropriated or even stolen, as Eric Lott has shown. In Spreadable Media, Henry Jenkins and his co-authors suggest that commercial and cultural appropriative tendencies are embedded as fundamental flaws in Web 2.0, which they say transforms the social goods generated through interpersonal exchanges into user-generated content that can be taken up and used by anyone. Even so, professional and amateur artists, fans, and anti-fans cry foul over recontextualizations of material over which they feel a sense of ownership, even when it circulates widely on the web and beyond, beyond anyone's direct control. Digital media's inherent promiscuity enables what I would call, in a rereading of Diana Taylor, infelicitous acts of transfer. There is a failure when a gesture or movement circulates as a commodity with a market value rather than as an expression of belonging and cultural affiliation. And yet it is precisely this failure, this abstraction and decontextualization that allows movement to circulate freely across bodies, regardless of community affiliation or prior training. Although access as a form of dispossession is not unique to 21st century markets, Randy Martin attributes it to the current era of financialization, which he says brings people together only to seem to take away what they thought they possessed. Thomas de France has similarly questioned the neoliberal right of access that renders community practices available for general consumption, noting that global markets allow dances to be appropriated and repurposed as intellectual property to generate profit. One of the core issues I find as dance moves circulate through video games and choreographies are popularized online is credit. In giving credit where it's due, as the saying goes, one expresses gratitude as well as obligation to the individual or group from whom one has borrowed. But credit is also a measurement of, of a capacity for indebtedness, which not only operates 
um, economically, according to Marzullo uh, Lazarado. Sorry for massacring that name. Um, it also produces subjectivity in conjunction with amorality and following Foucault forms of life. Solvency is a measurement of moral character. However, because credit relations always exist within an imbalance of power, the valuation of character reflects that imbalance with curious effect. Namely, some parties are indemnified against their debts and others are not. The more capital one has, whether financial or social, the more capacity one has for debt. This additional capacity for debt does not result in increased indebtedness, however, as excess capital indemnifies against the burden of debt. In other words, the more capacity one has for debt, the less one, the less one is expected to repay. The differential consequences for the production of subjectivity are quite profound. There are some of us who can literally afford to disavow our debts to others, who can refuse the ideological force of debt by refusing its subjectivity. The current debates regarding the ethics of embodiment are part of the double nature, double binds, and double standards of credit, debt, and belonging, the accounting of accountability. So even as I celebrate this digital moment with its unleashing of dance documentation, I'm not so naive as to think that increased access is independent of neoliberal rhetorics of freedom that foster the creation of public domains from which wealth can be extracted. This is precisely why I think there's such important work to be done with digital research and dance studies. The fields of dance technology and the digital humanities have produced exciting approaches to research, but with their computational bias, interpretation and critique can easily fall to the wayside. Digital research in dance studies has the opportunity to utilize digital methods of analysis while bringing forward modes of producing critical cultural histories of movement and critical histories of movement cultures that are at the heart of the field. Thank you. Produced by Duke University. Online at duke.edu.